Hello, and welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today we'll start or continue our conversation about Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. We will begin from page, bottom of page 58, and then move on to page 59. <clears throat> now, if you recall previously, the last paragraph that I had read to you and we had talked about it was about he going into the oppressor consciousness, right? And he starts uh, an explanation of the oppressor consciousness. Now, I strongly request you to go and watch uh, part eight of this lecture series in which uh, we explain it, and I will put it up there, you know, uh, uh, for you to f uh, click on it. But uh, there is something different I'm doing in this video, and that is that I will be combining my face-to-face -face discussion with you, and then wherever I read, I will go into a screen recording mode. So I hope that works. If it doesn't, let me know. And as always, uh, please do subscribe to the channel because I would love to have your support. So here we go reading the next passage still the bottom of page 58 uh, as, as a continuation of Freire's discussion of the oppressor consciousness. And after I read, I will explain it a little. So you can see that we had left uh, the last lecture somewhere here, right? And we are still talking about the possessor consciousness. So we are still on the bottom page of part of page 58 and starting here, what he says is, and I read, as beneficiaries of a situation of oppression, the oppressors cannot perceive that if having is a condition of being, it is a necessary condition for all women and men. This is why their generosity is false. Humanity is a thing, and they possess it as an exclusive right as inherited property to the oppressor consciousness, the humanization of the others, of the people, appears not as the pursuit of all humanity, but as subversion. I go on. The oppressors do not perceive their monopoly on having more as a privilege which dehumanizes others and themselves. They cannot see that in the egoistic pursuit of having as a possessing class, they suffocate in their own possession, possessions and no longer are. They merely have. For them, having more is an inalienable right, a right they acquire through their own effort with their own courage to take risks. If others do not have more, it is because they are incompetent and lazy and worst of all is their unjustifiable ingratitude towards the general, generous gestures of the dominant cl class. Precisely because they are ungrateful and envious, the oppressed are regarded as potential enemies who must be watched. Okay, so think a little about what I just read, right? Because he's explaining the dominant possessor consciousness. And this consciousness is something which we have previously learned that it is inherited. And it has already internalized a certain logic of its own privilege. And that is what becomes their worldview, right? So whenever, if the peasants rise, if the oppressed rise and try to change the system to the oppressor consciousness, to the possessive consciousness, that comes across as, a, as an integral threat to their collective and individual selves, right? Because here is what they think, right? What they think is um, that, that, for, that they are the ones, even if they don't rationally talk about it, they think that they have the right to life more than the others, that they have earned it, 
right? And that if they have gotten somewhere, and if they are rich and prosperous, it's because they are more innovative and they, they are you know they work harder than others these are all the rationalizations latent and blatant that they use right and because the oppressed have risen and are asking for more rights since that challenges their individual and collective collective identities so the rationalization that is given is first of all that these people are ungrateful we have done so much for them but there is no way we can make them happy and two they are undeserving because the poor are poor because they didn't work hard. It's their own fault. So that blaming the victim's mentality is at play, right? Now remember, Freire is trying to teach us to understand the oppressive, oppressor consciousness. And look around you in the world. There are protests going on right now in the United States, right? People who are in solidarity with African Americans, because let's not forget, this fight, these protests are about how African American bodies and humans are treated by power on the streets, right? Now, people who are in sympathy with that, in solidarity with that, it doesn't matter what your race and color or ethnicity is, are in solidarity with it because they have somehow undone their oppressor consciousness and have realized that humanization for all is actually a good thing. People who have reactionary responses to that, including the current US president, right? What kind of argument is that? The same argument that these people, it's their own fault. They are violent, right? So, uh, you know, that these people are violent, they, it's their own fault, they, they don't work hard enough. Almost all the racist arguments from the dominant group are based in that, which relies on blaming the victims. While the same people uh, posit their acquisition of things and possessions as something positive, uh, because they are the ones who keep the economy going, right? And, um, this idea that they somehow have the absolute right to have more. And what he's trying to say is that that is also dehumanizing because in the end these people become just possessors of things and they have, they develop this tendency of inanimating things including human beings. I mean, think of these CEOs and people who come and say, I can turn this company around. I mean, how many times have you read that story? Such, such and such company hired a CEO and he turned it around and make it profitable. What does that involve? It always involves looking at workers as inanimate things, as producers of labors. And then most of the times the first step they take is fire a lot of people because their idea of those people is as inanimate people, right, Wh whose lives could be impacted by their decisions, but since earning a profit in itself has become a noble pursuit, they have internalized it, right, and that gives them a sense of their own humanity. So that's what he's talking about. And then the idea of policing the victims of this aggressive system right, constantly, not only are the poor and the oppressed posited as undeserving, lazy, but they are also posited as a threat, and an entire edifice of security state is built around them. And, and the idea that they need to be constantly watched, and that permeates the oppressive consciousness. It's not just the state that does that. I mean, if you look at United States cities, right, uh, most poor areas are more heavily policed. The logic is, well, that's where more crime is. But since there is more police there, right, more and more arrests are made in the same area, right? And you always blame the victims as if policing can solve the, the socioeconomic problems. Think of uh, how dangerous it is to internalize that consciousness, the two men who killed Mr. Aubrey, you know, 
they had internalized this idea that not only as private citizens of United States, they can become police in the justice system, but they can only actually also kill someone if they think that that person, in their view, is doing something illegal or wrong. Or the if you want to go to the Floyd killing, right? Of that policeman who did that. What creates a person like that? Obviously, you know, you don't read a book and become like that. You must have internalized this idea that you are somehow superior to the person you're killing right there in front of the cameras. You must have thought of them as not human, right? as less than you. That gesture, it speaks of that. But think of it in the process, what happened to that policeman, right? He himself stopped being human because what he did was an inhuman, cruel, cowardly act. And think of the dehumanization of that police officer, right? That there are people filming him and telling him, this person is suffocating. But that had no impact on him. That's the level of dehumanized, dominant consciousness that Freire is talking about in the passage that I just led. So the work of critical pedagogy can't just be scratching at the surface. How do we dislodge that terrible thing, being, that the oppressor class, the dominant class, has internalized? Right? Sorry, you know, I'm getting emotional at this, but this book, what, is, what it's talking about, is not in the past, right? It's right here in our lives, as you, me, and everyone else lives in this world and dies in it. These things are still happening. We still have not been able to dislodge the oppressor, the possessive consciousness here in the United States. And we still haven't learned from the oppressed to change the system. I'll keep on reading. I'll just probably read another passage and then stop today and then continue this chapter in the next lecture. Page 59, and I'll read a little more. It could not be otherwise, right? And this is that, I, I'll explain it. If the humanization of the oppressed signifies subversion, so also does their freedom. Hence the necessity for constant control. And the more the oppressors control the oppressed, the more they change them into apparently inanimate things. This tendency of the oppressor consciousness to inanimate everything and everyone it, it, it encounters in its eagerness to possess unquestionably correspond with the tendency to sadism. So after this passage, he will give us a brief explanation of sadism, right? But as I was talking about earlier before I read this passage, is that, that this tendency to dehumanize others, to make them into things, is a deeper part of dominant oppressive consciousness. And one purpose of liberating the oppressors then is to dislodge this from themselves, right? Because it's so far deep in their consciousness and there are so many rationalizations and justifications that they have learned that to undo is not an event, it's a project. So as I was talking about the current situation in the United States, um, you see that oppressive consciousness at play in the statements that are coming out from the right-wing media and the politicians and, and the President of the United States. I mean, think of it. Think of Mr. Trump. What is he as a human being? 
a person who is in his entire life has not been answerable to anyone, who has pretty much done whatever he wants, said whatever he wants. Now that is what appeals to his followers. Why? Because they think he's honest, he's not afraid of anything, right? But that is exactly the kind of consciousness that is not needed in this moment of crisis, right? What is needed is someone who can leave the edifice of self and look at the world from the point of view of the other, right? From their point of view. And only then will a person like this with such immense power would effect some change. But it is not going to happen because that oppressor consciousness, because of his wealth, because of his now power, right, is so deeply consti constituted that identity. And his followers who invest in that kind of identity, what are their arguments also? They are also the ones who think the poor are lazy. They are also the ones who have racist views, who have sexist views. So, so the change then would come you know, through a long-term pedagogical project. But the way he refers to sadism at the end, where he's going with that, and I will read more and explain more with next lecture, lecture is that one aspect of psychological sadism is that you treat the body of the other as a thing, right? And that's what he's talking about, that, that the consciousness, the oppressor, oppressive or oppressor consciousness is sadistic, right? And acknowledging that is the first step for me, for you, and for the oppressed in the project of liberating ourselves, but also the oppressors. So that's all I have today. Thank you so much for joining me. And I'm hoping to conclude chapter one at least in the next couple of lectures, but as we know, uh, these, this is an unusual series because we're not just merely talking about Freire. We are actually reading Freire and talking about what he's saying and hoping that he can still teach us something transformative, something that can give us hope and enables us to change the world. All right. Thank you for being with me, and I am delighted that you give me your support, you lend me your support, and I will now see you next time. Until then, peace and love.